Right, um, my apologies, we can now reconvene. Um, I'm sorry to all members and to our witnesses for that slight interruption. I hope we can now proceed uh, without uh, further ado. Um, now, um, I previously asked Patrick Harvey if he would state uh, for the record if he had any um, uh, anything in his register of interest, and because that was not picked up by the microphones and by the official report, Patrick, I'm going to have to ask you to restate that, please, if you would. Thank you, convener. Uh, nothing additional to my uh, register of members' interests. Uh, members may want to be aware that I'm a member of a couple of organisations which are occasional witnesses to the EET committee, including the Poverty Alliance and Oxfam. We move to item two in the agenda, and we are taking evidence this morning from the Competition and Markets Authority. And I'd like to welcome from the CMA uh, David Curry, Lord Curry of Marylebone, who is the chair. Uh, and he's joined uh, by Alex Chisholm, Chief Executive, and by Sheila Scobie, Representative for Scotland. Welcome to you all. Thank you for coming along. And my apologies again uh, for you having to sit there patiently while we try and resolve our technical difficulties. The um, the, the work of the committee, uh, the work of the, the authority rather, is, is of great interest to, to our own committee. Um, and we've done a number of uh, pieces of work ourselves in recent times that uh, directly overlap with some of, some of your own forward work programme, particularly in the areas of uh, energy policy and in relation to, to banking. And I wonder if I could just start off, Lord Curry, by, by asking yourself, uh, and feel free to bring your, your colleagues in as, as you wish to comment on this, um, if you could maybe just outline for us, given that the CMA is a, a new organisation, you know, how you intend to take forward your, your work streams um, generally, but, but perhaps specifically in relation to these two matters, which I know will be of interest to, to committee members. Well, thank you very much, and it's, uh, we're very, very pleased to be here today. Um, this is a, a formal uh, hearing, but we've had a number of conversations over the last uh, year with you, Kavina, and, and others here in Scotland. Um, and it's great to have this opportunity to, to give formal evidence. We are a new agency um, formed from the Office of Fair Trading and the Competition Commission. Uh, and we want to ensure that our work is done even better than the work of the previous organisations. And therefore, we very much welcome views that the committee may have on how we should do things, because we are still establishing the ways in which we proceed. Um, we are an agency of the whole of the United Kingdom, and that does mean that we have to understand very much the concerns here in Scotland and other parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, and this type of hearing is one opportunity for us to, to do that, one of only a number of ways in which we seek to establish ourselves as really understanding the concerns of Scottish uh, consumers and Scottish people. Um, and uh, we really do want to make a difference to those, the operation of those markets that clearly aren't delivering satisfactorily for consumers here in Scotland and in other parts of the United Kingdom. Um, and that's why uh, we, early on, as a result of the Ofgem reference, we have the uh, investigation, the phase two investigation into the energy market um, we inherited an investigation into the payday lending market, which is also, I know, of, of, of concern to this committee. And we're consulting currently on whether we should be doing a phase two investigation into uh, the banking sector, and we'll make that decision fairly shortly. So those are clearly areas that you as a committee have been concerned with, and people in Scotland are concerned about it, the modes of operations. If I may hand over to my chief executive just to say a little more about the specifics of energy, uh, banking, and, and payday lending, um, and then we can proceed into questions. Thanks very much, um, and good morning to you all. It's great to be here. Um, so just to add a little bit of detail to, to what uh, David was just saying there about this particular uh, market inquiries that we're doing, um, in our various visits uh, to Choose Scotland and consultations with people, we've talked about which are the key sectors of concern to consumers here and energy and uh, banking and payday loans within the financial services sector have been three of the ones that have constantly come up. And um, so we have given real priority to those. And although the, the CMA um, only came into existence the 1st of October last year and, um, and only took on our powers the 1st of April of this year, 
Um, even before we, we formally started in April, we did a lot of work in the energy market, um, working closely with the Office of Fair Trading and with Ofgem, uh, and published a state of the market assessment in March, uh, really showing that um, the market wasn't performing very well for consumers. There wasn't enough competition and choice. There was a lot of concentration, very noticeable here in the, the, the Scottish market, um, and that the the, the the dynamics of the market didn't seem to be delivering at all well for um, consumers, um, and there was a lot of extreme dissatisfaction. I think around about forty percent of people didn't trust their energy supplier, which we thought was a very bad um, figure, and also a figure that had been growing over time. So um, <clears throat> we were very pleased when um, Ofgem made a formal market investigation reference to us in June, and we have been working very um, intensely on that. Uh, it's an eighteen-month inquiry. Um, that's uh, compared to previous 24-month inquiries, so we need to um, up our game and work faster. And they've been, uh, the, the inquiry group have been very active um, uh, just this week, actually. I think they've been in, uh, in Perth and also visiting the power station in Long Gannett. So um, uh, talking to, um, I think, SSE when they were in Perth, and also we've, we've been in touch with Scottish Power and Spark Energy and with a number of the consumer groups um, as well, so that's been a very important part of our work, one of our flagship projects. Um, turning to, to banking, um, banking is in a, a different situation in that we haven't at this stage made a market investigation reference, but in um, uh, again, soon after we started in April, we pulled together the existing work we inherited um, from the Office of Fair Trading in relation to the SME market, the small and medium-sized enterprise market. The concerns that uh, this committee uh, and others had raised with us, and I, we saw and very much appreciated the report that you did about access to finance. Um, again, as with the energy market, Scotland was, was probably a bit of an outlier in the sense that very high concentration levels were noticeable in the market here with many small businesses, particularly feeling they had a choice really of, of two firms for most practical purposes. Um, and that was uh, true to some extent in the retail market as well. So um, what we proposed in July was that uh, there should be a full market investigation reference of the whole of retail banking, both SMEs and personal current accounts, um, reflecting uh, the concerns we had again there about competition and consumer in interest not being well served um, at this stage. Um, before making a final reference, you have to consult, and so we have been consulting. We've had the responses back just um, a couple of weeks ago and intend to bring that to a point of final decision in the next month or so. Okay. The, um, uh, finally, in relation to payday, which David also mentioned, um, and again has been a, um, a very problematic sector and one which again, from our many dealings uh, in Scotland, have been very strongly emphasised, particularly, I suppose, in the urban areas in, in Glasgow and Edinburgh. Um, and the, uh, um, the reference group there, again, have been very uh, actively both doing direct consumer research, in, uh, particularly in those cities, but also talking to um, uh, experts here in Scotland, Money Advice Scotland, the Citizens Advice Service, um, the Trading Standards Bodies, and many others about... Um, how best to deal with the problems in the payday sector. Um, and uh, they feel they, they are close to a point now of, of being able to, to put out final remedies, um, which uh, they plan to do over the next few weeks with a final report due around about the end of the year. So that gives you a bit of an overview about where we are in those particular sectors, but very pleased, obviously, to try and deal with any questions or observations you might have. Okay. Th thank you very much both for, for that introduction and, and you've touched on a, a range of issues which I'm sure members will want to uh, tease out so, some detail uh, on. Um, now I'm hoping we will run this for about an hour and uh, give members a chance to ask what they can, but if I remind members if they would to keep their questions uh, short and, and to the point and, and uh, answers that are as, as focused as possible would be helpful just getting getting through the, the topics and the time available. Can, just before I bring in uh, Dennis Robertson, I just want to ask one, one follow-up question if I can. Um, Lord Curry, you were talking a bit about um, the, the committee's um, our relationship with Scotland, you're, you're a UK body, but do you want to say more, and maybe you want to bring Sheila Scobie in at this point to say a, a bit more about how, how you see the authority engaging specifically uh, with the Scottish interest and making sure that, that the, uh, the Scottish viewpoint is, is, is properly reflected in your work? Well, I think that's uh, a very important aspect of, of, of our work. Um, Sheila 
has responsibility for the Scottish office and is, in a sense, is, a, is one source of information into the organisation and a source of information back as to what we are doing. But that's only one part of it. What we are ensuring, as Alex has already indicated, is that our, all our inquiries, we actually take explicit account of the Scottish dimension in, in the work, hence the visits, the site visits, and coming to Scotland to talk to people here. And of course the board itself needs to have an appreciation of the Scottish concerns, Scottish interests, uh, and uh, that's why we met in June up here in Edinburgh as a board and had a, a range of meetings with uh, representative bodies. Uh, and I have to say, doing that was incredibly valuable. The, all board members said how useful it was, and it is something that will be a regular feature of our board, board meetings. So a variety of ways of engagement, and we're making sure that the executive in, in, the, in, in, in their work do actually make sure they are explicitly thinking about the Scottish and, of course, Welsh and Northern Irish uh, uh, interests and building that into the way in which the work is, 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 is conducted. Yeah, shall I say a few words about what I consider my role to be here in Scotland? I was appointed in January uh, very much with the view that CMA is a UK-wide organisation and needed some form of representation here in Scotland. I very much see my role as being about being the face of Scotland uh, within the CMA, helping uh, colleagues in London understand what the economic um, and political dynamics are here and understand what is of concern to consumer groups and polit politicians and, and policy thinkers here, but also, uh, also here to represent the CMA in Scotland and provide opportunities for colleagues with expertise and knowledge from the CMA to be visible in Scotland at events and meetings and opportunities like this here to talk to parliamentarians. Okay, thank you very much. Um, right, I'll bring in Dennis Robson. Uh, and, good, and good morning. Uh, can I come back maybe just on the energy aspect again? Um, with your inquiry that's ongoing w w within the energy markets, um, do you think that that has a, any impact on, uh, for instance, a government decisions w within Westminster, for instance, on EMR, uh, uh, and taking that forward? Because obviously whilst you're, uh, and we don't want to preempt any outcomes from your report, but whilst you're actually going through the sort of investigative aspect, do you think that that um, prevents any, um, a, a, any movement uh, either from government or indeed a, any from the a, a industries themselves? If, 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 I might, if I might try, try and re respond to that. So, so first of all, um, I think it's an, it's an excellent question. I think that's, that oftentimes we do get asked when we've got a big inquiry that on, does that create a kind of a pause in the market where both, both from the firm's point of view and for, indeed from, from the, the government and um, all the rest of the government and the regulators' perspective, mm -hmm. should they hold back on initiatives that they had in mind? And our, our, our message back to them is always and is in this case, no, you shouldn't hold back what you're trying to do. So there's no pause in the market. So if you're looking to invest in building a new power plant or coming up with some new scheme that you think will be advantageous to consumers or, um, or indeed from the regulator's perspective, pursuing a, um, uh, a necessary um, uh, change, change in their approach, we don't want them to, to hold back from that because we're doing this big wide in inquiry. In a market as big and complex as energy, there's always things happening, and so we, it's unrealistic and unhelpful for us to expect people to, to, to stop that. What is important is that the, the reference group that's been appointed pay attention to the continuing evolution in the market, and that's very much what they're bent on doing. Um, in relation to the, the policy framework that stands, they obviously need to take full account of the, the important European dimension to this with the energy directors that are in place. Um, uh, and, and the requirement for an internal energy market, uh, also the role of interconnectors and things within that. And the, from the government policy perspective, the EMR, the electricity market reforms, are really essential to the, to the government's objectives in delivering um, both uh, reliable and affordable and low carbon energy for um, the period ahead. So I think that's a very important policy context which the reference group will want to take account of. If when they look at the policy context or indeed the regulatory frameworks that have been established, if they see things which are um, diminishing the prospects for competition, then I would expect them to try and address them and to make recommendations or observations. But it's, as you rightly say, um, very early days at this stage in the inquiry. 
Um, they have themselves the reference group. Um, it's an independent reference group, I should say, that we're now into the second phase. So that, that moves outside of the control, if you like, of myself as chief executive or David as chair, uh, or indeed Sheila as well, to an independent appointed reference group, uh, in this case chaired by Roger Whitcomb. And that group uh, published in July um, an issue statement of some of the key the key um, points there that they uh, saw as being worthy of um, further inquiry. And that does include things like vertical integration. It includes things like um, the uh, potential for market power in electricity generation, which I think would probably touch on some of the areas covered by electricity market reform. Do you believe there's enough confidence then within the markets at the moment to, con to proceed with any investment? Or do you think really that because the inquiry is ongoing that some of the markets, and, and again, perhaps maybe we maybe primarily see within the renewable sectors, are actually holding back. So I think that, that there is um, an issue of confidence there, both in the consumer market with a degree of distrust there, and, and very likely in the, the supply side and investment thing. The, the government has been looking to establish the EMR as to provide that, 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 uh, that confidence in the investment um, scenario. The, um, we read in the papers that the European Commission is close to finalising its decision in relation to Hinkley Point, which I think will be very important to understanding the framework for future investment in nuclear, not just in the UK, but right across Europe. Um, the, uh, um, clearly, there must be some uncertainty associated with our inquiry for any, all of the players within that. But what we have um, found and observed is that um, people actually uh, in the industry have a degree of confidence in this as a very objective and very independent and very evidence-based process, one in which the views of industry players and consumer groups and everybody else are very carefully um, considered and there's ample opportunities to, to correct any errors of fact or analysis. Um, and furthermore, that ultimately the, the reference group, anything that it, it chooses to um, recommend by or to put in place by way of remedies, is subject to full legal scrutiny. Um, so I think that there are a number of safeguards there to make sure that whatever the reference group finds and comes up with will be something which is proportionate, which is they're required to do by law, um, and really justified by the facts. And I think that whenever we get the chance to speak with um, investor groups, we do rather emphasize those points, and they seem to find it reassuring. Thank you. And finally, convener for me, uh, just on the confidence aspect, how do you, how do you try and, uh, in terms of the consumer market, the customer-based market, um, how do we try and get the confidence back there that um, you are working towards uh, an outcome that will be beneficial to them? I think Lord Curry wanted to respond yeah. to, your, to your previous question first, so maybe let's okay. let, let, let do that. Just to add the point that I think one of the factors in the reference by Ofgem was the fact that there was a lot of uncertainty in the energy market anyway. Uh, so the inquiry is just one aspect of that, and therefore it's not obvious that the inquiry in any way adds to the uncertainty that was facing uh, investors, um, and therefore it's not a dampener on, on investment prospects. I appreciate that. Thank okay. you. Um, just, just to begin to try and answer the, the, the other question that you ask uh, uh, in relation to consumer confidence, and I think that's really a, a key issue in the inquiry, and as I say, I'm not a member of the inquiry group myself, so I don't want to say too much about it, but... Um, I mean, some things which I suspect will be very relevant will be, first of all, from the point of view of consumers, understanding what actually goes into um, th what they pay for. So understanding what their bills, how their bills are calculated, how the information is presented, um, understanding what their choices are, what options are open to them there, um, having confidence in the mechanisms for switching between one supplier and another, having confidence in the sources of information about um, how to switch, including very likely price comparison websites and things, which obviously play an important part, but also other intermediary channels. Um, I think probably having confidence in the underlying dynamic of the market, there's a questions have been raised about whether or not the, 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 there is really a fully effective competition between the so-called big six operators. And um, that undoubtedly has, has, I think, contributed to this um, uh, degree of consumer distrust. So we would hope that our inquiry would help to settle that matter one way or the other. Um, and also for people to see if action is, ju is justified that that's actually being taken. So I think that these will all be contributory factors. There's probably no silver bullet to consumer confidence. It's taken a while to degrade, if you like. It's going to take a while to build back up again, but I think it is very, very ne uh, necessary, especially for such an essential uh, utility as energy. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Jake Rodney. 
Good morning. <coughs> Excuse me. You've alluded to um, a European dimension in terms of the impact that would have on the directives have on um, allegedly on competition. I just wonder, in terms of the wider international uh, impact of, uh, I mean, for example, with the new uh, transaction uh, system coming down the pike from an agreement between the States and, and, and Europe, uh, and there are in various industries where there are dual tax arrangements and there are transfer pricing accommodations which one might suggest mitigates against the consumer interests. How wide is your remit to be with regard to international activities? Uh, I have to say fairly, fairly nar narrow. Um, I think that you raise a very interesting and important point that in the, the, the global economy as we stand, there, there are very likely quite considerable distortions in trade flows and investment associated with tax regimes. And there's probably, you know, in fairness, an ongoing debate about whether or not that 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 process of competition between countries based on tax is a is a welcome one or a harmful one. Um, and the, um, uh, the 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 way in which the tax codes have developed have not been in a fully coordinated way, and there is obviously considerable overlaps and tensions between them, which does create some scope for individual firms to. Um, to end up paying very low levels of taxation, um, it is an international issue. I think it's you know it's a uh, it's a G7 type type issue to try and bring about uh, coordinated action to reduce these distortions. It's not something where, quite honestly, the Competition and Markets Authority has much influence or say. But I think you're you're right um, to draw attention to the impact that it can have on investment. Um, we, you've probably seen. Um, that the, um, the European Commission have been making sounds very recently in relation to the um, Irish uh, tax arrangements in relation to Apple. So that's clearly an area where the, and that's, that's, that's the competition director of the European Commission who are responsible for state aids as well. So that would suggest to me that they see some potential for some distortion there. So we'll have to watch that one carefully. So I think there is scope probably at the European level to see if there are um, uh, things which are distorting trade within the internal market, but probably to really grasp this this nettle, I think is going to require a lot of international coordination. Thank you. In the um, the briefing, the you mentioned the mission is to make markets work well for consumers, and you're tasked with delivering benefits to UK consumers of at least ten times its cost, well over half a billion pounds every year. In, in consumers' pockets. How were these outcomes arrived at? I mean, interaction of uh, uh, consumer needs and wants uh, are different. Clearly, cost of ownership is different. I mean, how, how is the number arrived at, the, this 10 times cost and also uh, saving well over half a billion pounds every year or putting them in back in consumers' pockets? established methodology that's been applied to the work of the Office of Fair Trading and Competition Commission in the past. It's based on academic research. It is clearly an estimate, but it is a methodology that's not controlled by us. In other words, we're audited, in a sense, by others. Uh, and I think it's a, it does attempt, as best one can, to estimate real benefits to real consumers. I'm not going to try and articulate how it's done because it is rather a complex process <laughs> inevitably but it is the benchmark that we've been set to achieve and interestingly uh, the Office of Fair Trading in its last year of operation did achieve that 10 to 1 uh, ratio which makes it a pretty good investment in, in, in terms of investing in the competition work that we are, are doing as an authority and that may have been the reason why the UK government decided to increase our budget by something like 30% uh, to enhance the work and the effectiveness of what we do. Yes, and I mean, just, just to add to that, in fact, the, the, the UK um, has been a leader in the effort to try and um, develop robust methods for calculating the impact of interventions by competition authorities. And the work done... Um, I think it was it was led out of the University of East Anglia, the competition and consumer um, group there, uh, has now been adopted by the OECD basically as the kind of international standard for that. So again, I think that probably should give some 
comfort to people that this is a fairly re robust and reliable method of calculating these impacts. Um, it's also based on so-called direct benefits. So if you make a market intervention and you, <clears throat> uh, for example, put in place a price control or a transparency measure, which you can then see has some impact on prices thereafter, then that, that gets calculated. What we haven't yet found out a good way to do is to calculate indirect benefits. So, um, so for example, um, from uh, achieving a high level of confidence in the um, on the investor community or on the consumer community in the marketplace, or when you bring in an individual uh, compliance action, we measure the direct effect of that compliance action, not the knock-on effect in deterring other people. So probably even the 10 to 1 is quite a conservative figure in terms of what the total impact of, uh, for the economy is of competition authorities such as ourselves. Okay, thank you. Uh, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, convener. Um, just to follow on the, the question really about the, the nature of the authorities' uh, priorities, its purposes. Um, Chick Brody mentioned the, the briefing we've got. It actually says that the CMA's mission is to make markets work well for consumers, business and the economy. But the, the legislation that creates you, and I confess I haven't read every dot and comma, uh, it's, it's fairly clear that the, um, the purpose is to seek to promote competition within and outside the UK for the benefit of consumers. What happens when there's a conflict between the interests of consumers and the interests of GDP growth or the interests of business in any particular sector? Or, or is the, the phrase consumers, business and the economy a sort of article of faith that these things are always the same? Well, I think our view is that in general they are the same. I mean, first to be clear, our primary duty is to consumers and delivering consumers be benefit now and into the future. Um, we think that making markets work well is also good for business, uh, good businesses, not the ones that want to do uh, dirty deeds, but the good, good businesses thrive in open competitive markets. And therefore, on the whole, what is good for consumers is also good for the innovative dynamic uh, uh, business. And on the whole, the evidence is, the empirical evidence is that uh, competition, open markets, effective competition, is also good for growth. Uh, not short term, but long, longer term growth. And therefore, we do think the three things fit together. Consumer interests at the heart of what we do. Businesses thrive in open markets if, if, they're, if they're innovative. And that's all good for the overall growth of the economy. But where there was an example where you, if you were looking at a particular sector of the economy or a particular industry, uh, if there was clear evidence that consumer interests were not being protected even though businesses were doing well and GDP growth was doing well, your legal duty would be to focus on the consumer absolutely. interests. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, to, to, to give one example, the, um, the, the, the um, high interest loans, the, the issue you mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the, the briefing also suggests that your concern is that that's happening because of a lack of competition. Now, if, if some intervention was made and we had greater competition, but some consumers were still paying exploitative rates of interest, uh, that would clearly not be in the interests of those consumers, even though it's a more competitive market. Uh, you know, businesses can sell rubbish products uh, with big marketing budgets, with clever gimmicks and so on. We only need to look around the world and see that these things are possible. So having healthy competition doesn't guarantee that consumers' interests are being promoted. No, I think that's, that's an excellent point that you make, and it's also a good, good market to look at from that perspective, because if you um, consider really the, the, the interventions that we're making, they, they make most sense, I think, seen alongside the, 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 the uh, responsibilities and interventions that the Financial Conduct Authority are doing as well. So if you, I mean, obviously there's, there's an issue about potentially unscrupulous firms getting into the market and, and exploiting consumers. So that is an issue that's probably best um, addressed by regulation for a licensing scheme to make sure that... that to a market but already being there. Or, or, or indeed being in the market, absolutely point made. And that's something which the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, have been who are responsible for, for regulating this market and for licensing firms have been very, uh, very clear on themselves. And they are considerably tightening up, I think, the requirements for being in this market and quite a number of firms as a consequence are exiting from the market. So that's one important element of regulation. 
The second important element of regulation, it seems, here in this market, and this has been a government initiative but being implemented by the Financial Conduct Authority, is to put in place a price cap, um, a maximum rate that can be charged, um, which, as you know, will take effect from January of next year. So we're really the, the third leg of the stool by saying, well, even, even though this is a, a price uh, cap, um, what can sometimes happen with caps which are intended as... Um, as ceilings is that they also become floors and that becomes the going rate. We would actually like to see some competition even below the level of the cap for people saying, well, look, this is a better, this is the, the, the terms that I'm offering offer better value to consumers, which ultimately it's a financial product. The cost of the financial product is very, very important. And, and the, the work of the, the CMA reference group here, again, this is a second stage inquiry, it's done by an independent group, has really focused on how um, when consumers are making choices in this market, they seem to be at the moment very much driven by the convenience. It's mainly through the digital channels and very, you know, sort of two or three clicks and you're there to making a loan. However, you've got the money, but the cost of that is sometimes extraordinarily high. So um, um, they believe that it's important to try and um, promote uh, the, the cost of the loan uh, alongside its convenience as a, relevant, as a relevant choice characteristic for consumers and to give people better information on that, more prompting to consider what it's actually going to cost you um, and also uh, to try and um, uh, to Im improve the role of the intermediaries such as price comparison websites in this regard, particularly making it clear that um, if someone is holding out to you um, a choice of alternative suppliers, are they really offering kind of um, a, a true brokering service for you or are they actually working on behalf of the, the providers of credit where in effect your details when applying for a loan are being sold to the highest bidder and we've been very concerned by some of the misrepresentation going on there. Just, just finally on this, this question, what I'm really keen to, to explore is the, the nature of the authority and the, the various interests that it's there to represent rather than the, the detail of this particular industry, which I'm sure there'll be other time to, to explore. It, so if I, somebody from my political leanings was to, to frame legislation to give you a, a legal purpose, <coughs> I might have talked about uh, protecting the, the benefit of people or the common good rather than necessarily consumers. That seems to imply that it's only in that consumer relationship uh, that the impacts of... of uh, market activity is, is relevant to your responsibility. What role do you have or what role could you have in a, in a market, for example, where social and environmental costs were being externalised? They weren't being borne by the businesses involved. They weren't being borne by those businesses' customers either, but by wider society, waste management, energy, transport, a whole host of... You could probably sh make a shorter list of the, the examples where that isn't the case. What role do you have where those, those kind of costs, those kind of impacts of market activity are not being borne by consumers as consumers, but by people as citizens? I think in, in general, where there are those externalities, the mechanisms best for, for best dealing with them are forms of taxes and, 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 and levies of, of, of various kinds, um, rather than the instruments that are in our control, because we obviously have, don't have those powers. Having said that, I think if we had a, if we were doing a market inquiry into a sector and we felt that there were those external effects, that is something that the inquiry group could look at and could take account of in their in, in their recommendations. And, and just coming back on the previous question, I think it is important to emphasise that although we're called the Competition and Markets Authority, in addition to our competition role, we have a very important consumer protection role, which we play with. Training standards, training standards of Scotland, citizens advice of Scotland, um, and working the, the consumer protection, working together with our competition powers, is actually a powerful combination. So we're not purely focused on the competition aspects. We are concerned about the impacts of in, on individuals, uh, particularly that of uh, uh, firms that are behaving inappropriately. Specifically, uh, it impacts of, on individuals as consumers rather than as people yes. in the wider yes. sense. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Joe McCampbell, do you have a follow-up on this? Point? There was a specific yeah. supplementary on yeah. that, uh, that that conflict that uh, Mr Harvey um, outlined. And the example that I was going to use was nuisance calling. Uh, you're probably aware that Consumer uh, Which had a survey that found 85% of consumers had received nuisance calls. And as a result, almost half of the people surveyed 
didn't like picking up their home phone. Now, the Scottish Government, had they had the powers um, over this matter, had already outlined what they would do, which would have been an effective enforcement uh, regime with penalties uh, and a code of practice. What are you proposing to do about nuisance calls? It's a matter for Ofcom, I think. Um, in, in the UK have responsibility for this. To also, the Information uh, Commissioner's Office, that's the, that's the combination, and they, they are developing. Like our proposal was to have a much more integrated system of, of mm. regulation, um, which would have meant that we could have put effective protection in place. But I think those issues are very much an issue for Ofcom to, to, to take, and in a sense, the integration of regulation is already there. Well, for consumer protection, that's you know, consumers are being well, protected, and the, the, so their data has been sold, and so on. There is a concurrency arrangement in, in, in particular in, in the regulated sectors, and so, but in, 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 in the case of nuisance calls and that sort of thing, I think the primary consumer protection role would fall to Ofcom. So I think they're the people who should I think be that perhaps highlights some of the problems with the fragmented nature of um, regulation in the UK. Um, I, I don't think so. I mean, we, we coordinate quite effectively with m many different uh, bodies. I, mean, I mentioned our relationship with Trading Standards Scotland and Trading Standards more generally. Um, but, I mean, the primary role is, is quite clear in this particular case. It's not for us, it's for, it, 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 it is a matter for Ofcom, and that's not just passing the buck. I think, you know, it is a serious, a serious issue. Could, could I just add, I think Trading Standards Scotland, which is based in COSLA, has actually looked at this particular issue and, um, you know, are, are working with local, local uh, authorities to consider whether there are interventions they can, that can take place locally. So, um, you know, certainly if, if you would like, I'd put you in contact with Trading Standards Scotland to see what they're doing. Okay, thank you. Um, Mike McKenzie. Thank you, uh, convener, and good morning. Um, I'm very delighted to hear that you're taking such a keen interest in Scotland and that you believe that the challenges for you are somewhat different in Scotland, perhaps, than the rest of the UK. I'd be very interested to hear what you think those differences are. What are the special challenges that you find in Scotland in terms of your remit? Well, let me have a first go at that and then ask Alex to continue. I mean, one issue which is is important clearly is the is the urban rural uh, uh, balance that's an issue within England and Wales but it, yeah, we're very conscious of the fact that Scotland has urban concentrations but also very significant rural, rural communities and that uh, poses issues in a number of different markets um, and also the nature of concentration we've already referred to the fact that the energy market here is more concentrated than it is in other parts of the United Kingdom, and that's relevant to our, our, our investigations. So those are two particular things that we would be very conscious of. It, I, I mean, one shouldn't em overemphasize the differences. What's important for us is that we are in touch with, with, with the interests in Scotland, but also in Wales, Northern Ireland, the north of England, various parts of the United Kingdom, and, and that's an important part of our remit. Yeah. Uh, just, just to add to that, I think that um, that's absolutely right, David, that we shouldn't, sometimes people uh, misdiagnose differences between um, different parts of the UK according to the nations or the regions, but actually the differences are more to do with high population density versus low population density, urban versus rural. But I think having said that, um, in Scotland, so um, uh, the, I suppose one of the the kind of guiding lights that we'd say to all of our groups carrying out these inquiries is pay attention to these differences and look for differences. So um, in relation to, for example, um, the payday sector, they um, paid a lot of attention over the course of the last year to potential differences in, in, um, in Scotland along with other parts of the UK. That was one of the reasons why they've conducted a lot of consumer market research here and also um, interviewed all the main players here, both on the supply side and the um, consumer side. Um, they did sign, find, I believe, some, some differences in structure, so particularly in the, the high street, for example, um, one of the, uh, the larger high street lenders called Speedy Cash does not operate at all in Scotland, but is very active in England. Um, other 
main, main high street chains such as the money shop are operating right across the UK. So they have to pay attention to see whether or not the, the differences, because there are always going to be differences, whether they make, a, whether they make enough of a difference to, to justify looking at Scotland as a separate market or as part of the UK market. That's also a feature of um, the work that um, has been going on recently in relation to other sectors such as private motor insurance we haven't talked about yet. But again, looking for differences at the national level there, they found actually the, the Northern Ireland market was quite distinct in some respects from the UK one. Um, and uh, again, reflecting probably some differences in, uh, in industry structure and links with the, the Republic of Ireland. Um, it's, it's probably un unwise to generalise too much about Scottish consumers and their differences compared to any other part of the UK. But um, maybe just to make one observation, and that is that um, from the research that we've done and from contacts that we've had with consumer groups here, we have noticed that quite a number of Scottish consumers would have quite a high level of loyalty for Scottish brands, um, including in relation to um, energy and banking, and that this actually reduces their likelihood of switching to an alternative provider from elsewhere in the UK. So when we look at high concentration levels on the supply side, we see that those are to some extent being reinforced by consumer loyalty, or if you put it um, less positively, inertia of staying with established brands through thick and thin, even where sometimes the, the performance and the service has not been as good as, as consumers would have wished, they still don't change. So I think that's that's one one characteristic that we've noticed in some some segments. But again, I wouldn't try and generalise right across the economy. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, I would, you know, as, as, as I'd like to just move on slightly, in, in, in as much as, as, and it's no secret, I represent the Highlands and Islands um, region of Scotland, um, an area that I can only characterise as suffering from multiple market failure. And I hope that you'll spend a bit more time in Scotland and come to the Highlands and Islands and see the effects of that for yourself. And if I could just very quickly run through some of the main ones. Um, postal and delivery charges that are disproportionate. Um, a service that's sometimes just not available at all on some of our islands. Um, mobile broadband, um, no 3G to speak of. Very little in a worsening situation with two... To, uh, 2G, uh, desperate telephone signal. Uh, uh, what, what, I'm describing, um, what I'm describing are instances of clear market failure. Um, please tell me if that's not at all of interest to you. Um, high fuel costs, high food costs. Um, the, the, you made an interesting point about you know, um, brand loyalty, if you like, but it's a fact that SSE, for instance, are... Um, one of the very few few uh, energy supply companies that offer a storage heater tariff. Um, and in off-gas grid areas, people depend much more highly mm. on storage heaters than they do in other parts of the country. Um, and yet they're not able to change a uh, supplier because SSE are pretty much the only company offering an appropriate tariff. There seems to me to be a very, very clear uh, case for intervention. And then again, in terms of fuel poverty, uh, you, you, you know, um, manifesting itself in Scotland's islands at over 50%, and yet we can't access smart meters because th those depend on a 2G signal. So it seems to me the Highlands and Islands suffer from a whole basket of market failures. Could you, you know, explain to me, please, if that comes under your remit at all, um, and if it does, are you able to, to do anything about it? Okay, um, so just um, to try and both de describe what, what is within our remit and what is not and what we're doing about it, those areas that are within our remit. Um, uh, first of all, for regulation of um, energy tariffs um, and also of um, uh, the universal service in telephony um, and also the uh, coverage requirements <laughs> for mobile signals, uh, all of those are the responsibility of sectoral regulators, uh, obviously energy, the, the, the um, office for, um, for gas and electricity and uh, Ofgem and uh, Ofcom for the communications market. Um, they, they would have within their own rules um, uh, a lot of responsibility written in to make sure that vulnerable consumers are, are not disadvantaged by 
um, the, the provision of the postal service, the telephony service, um, and, and obviously uh, electricity um, supply as well. Um, the built into that, their schemes is inherently a cross subsidy because the cost of providing those types <coughs> of utilities is much higher proportionately in low population density areas than it is in high population density areas. So for reasons of, of public policy and social cohesion, the, the fundamental schemes like that do involve a cross subsidy, which obviously is beneficial for people in, um, in more remote communities. Um, if I could just highlight two areas where we've been active in trying to address um, the issues that you um, mention, uh, particularly for people in Highlands and Islands. Um, one is that the, the OFT, our predecessor body, or one of the two, um, carried out a very detailed study of remote communities and from that um, used that as a kind of um, platform for trying to bring about change in a number of areas. And one of the issues that certainly came through very strongly through that study was the cost of delivery. Um, and I think the, um, a set of principles for retailers were developed partly as a consequence of this OFT initiative, uh, were developed by the Scottish Government here, and then I think have now been um, effectively sort of uh, copied and applied right across the UK um, by the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills. Um, so that has been something to try and make sure that there is a... Um, a clear sense of responsibility and a fair deal available from retailers for people um, living in rural communities so far as delivery charges apply. Um, something which we've been very active with in the last um, year and more um, has been a, an enforcement action that we took in relation to the supply of, um, uh, of, of road fuels in the um, Western Isles of Scotland. Um, and uh, I think we spoke about this when we were last, um, David and myself, were last meeting with, with yourself uh, in Edinburgh. And the, uh, at that stage, we, didn't, uh, we hadn't brought the case to a conclusion, but that has now um, uh, finally concluded. And the, um, what we've been able to achieve there is both to break a number of the exclusive agreements, which were tying in a lot of the garages to one supplier, which meant it very hard for any alternative supplier to come into the market or for any um, real price com you know, competition to come in. Um, secondly, we've managed to um, achieve by negotiation a set of legal commitments, which mean that the dominant provider in that market, a firm called GB Oils, um, are now obliged to uh, make their facility for landing fuel, um, the depot, available to alternative suppliers and also on a short term. So we think that's going to be very positive for the, again, the competitive dynamic in the market because we really do understand that in island communities, the cost of access to fuel is really critical and we, which is why we gave real attention to that uh, case and we're very pleased with the result we've been able to achieve following a lot of local consultation over two rounds over the last few months. So can I take it from what you were saying in the, in, in, earlier on that um, you really only operate um, when you're not treading on another regulator's turf, so to speak. Or are you more generally concerned with market failures that other regulators are quite manifestly, manifestly failing to deal with? That the, the, the notion of the regime we have, which uh, David Wright described as concurrency, means that we have competition and consumer powers, and so do the sectoral regulators. Um, like any other agency, we have to make sure that we make the best possible use of our resource. We're actually not a very big agency. It may seem like we have 600 staff, which may seem quite substantial, but actually that's, very, that's smaller than Ofcom, uh, smaller than Ofgem, a lot smaller than the Financial Conduct Authority and others. So that and we're responsible right across the economy. So we need to make sure that we put our, our limited resource where we think we can achieve the best possible result. And, and again, keeping in mind that 10 to 1 ratio we discussed earlier. So in, in, in essence, if we feel that they, they have the responsibility, they have the mandate, and they're fulfilling it, then there's no particular need for us to get involved. If, on the other hand, as you were suggesting, if we felt that they had failed to do something and it was clear that was the case, then, then we do have the power to step in, yes. Right, you can't, that's interesting. You can't tread in their turf. I, I mean, because it, you, know, you talked about PD lending and there are other regulators that regulate financial services. So um, 
I'm, I'm a wee bit struck as well. I mean, like, sorry, we're short of time. Sure. You've got yeah, one more no, question, can you? Yeah, no, I'm happy to finish it. Right. Can do that. Fine, thank you. Um, Dennis, want to come in with a brief supplementary? Just a very brief supplementary. Um, I'm interested in the fact that you were mentioning the, the, the Scottish brands and the loyalty to maybe two uh, Scottish brands from people living in Scotland here. Um, is it not slightly misleading that, uh, whether it be in the energy or the banking sectors, which are two main ones, actually continue to use that sort of Scottish brand to Scottish consumers uh, when they're actually owned by a, um, uh, their, their parent companies are not uh, indeed um, Scottish in Scotland? Is that not? I mean, we'll look at consumer protection, or we'll look at the competition. But basically, you're saying, you know, whether big banking or energy, you know, they're promoting this sort of Scotland bit, but actually, it's not Scottish. I think that's an issue much more generally. If, if one asks what's the nationality of any particular international company, very hard to define. You know? Transparent. <laughs> okay, we can leave that one to stick to the wall for the time being, I think. Okay, um, Richard Baker. My question touches on international issues uh, as well, though I know you've got a very limited role in that, but in response to Mr Brodie earlier, um, you talked about European issues, and clearly OECD and others are doing a lot of work on unfair tax competition. Is that work that you can feed into at all, or do you just observe that from a distance, or, or do you have any kind of remit within that? I think we were looking at a particular market where we felt that unfair tax competition was really distorting that market, then that was something that we would like to share with the OECD, yes. And in terms of domestic market, I think Lord Corey maybe referred to this earlier as well, if you felt in terms of domestic taxation too, and you're looking into a market and somebody's getting an, an advantage <laughs> there because of their taxation practices, that's something you'd also bring up to, to government in, uh, in, in the UK as Something well. we can... Uh, we, we don't have powers to deal yeah. with taxation, but it, they are things that we could bring to uh, the attention of government, we could uh, write about or we could um, talk about it uh, pu publicly. I mean, just in terms of our international work generally, I mean, we cooperate through the European Competition Network. That's close cooperation amongst the competition authorities in the EU. We then also input into what is called the International Competition Network, which is a network of something like two, uh, 130 countries, uh, where there's a lot of cooperation between the competition authorities internationally, partly to help uh, developing countries to uh, uh, develop their competition powers and, and, and bring them up to international standards. And we also do similar collaboration with the competition part of the uh, OECD. So there is a great deal, you know, our, our reference, the reference in our duty to looking after the interests of consumers, both in the UK and internationally. Our international dimension of our work is an important aspect. And having a fair global regime in terms of tax competition must be part of that. <laughs> Overemphasise our powers to... And, to of course, I understand that. that. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. OK, Marco Biaggi. A lot of the examples that were referred to in uh, the, the briefing and some of the materials we've had have been about where there are a small number of companies operating in a way that doesn't, doesn't work terribly well. Um, but largely it seems to come from the, the number. When you're looking at possible competitive distortions... Do you look as well at things like barriers to entry for new firms and also uh, transparency of information? For example, I can think of two markets that are quite healthy in terms of the number of providers, um, mortgages and telecommunications, but where the terms are not very easily comparable and where there might be uh, market distortions there. Is that something you think about and, and how much of a weight does that sort of issue take? I think it's very much something that we think about. So I think you, you hit on one of the sort of core analytical areas for us where we we don't have, a, if you like, a, what we would regard as a slightly old-fashioned structuralist approach of just saying how many players are there in the market. That'll tell you whether there's a problem or not because we find it depends on the dynamic. So just to expand a little bit on that. So you could look at a market such as the global market for, for mobile devices, smartphones, um, and... Uh, and if you'd looked, uh, say, 10 years ago, uh, no, about eight years ago, you'd have seen that 98% that, uh, of the profits in that market were made by just two firms, Apple and Samsung. Um, the, uh, if you look at what's happened since, there's been a lot of change in that. If you go back 15 years, you'd find that most of the profits were made by Nokia. So, in fact, at any particular point in time, you might say that 
one or two firms seem to be very strong, but it's actually, if you look, it keeps changing. Um, and there is, there's a huge amount of dynamism within that market. So that's a very global market. It's a very valuable market, but it would be difficult to say that one firm was very dominant in it. At least it might appear so for a moment, but it changes. So by purely looking at a single point in time and saying, what's the market shares, it's probably not going to help you very much. In other markets where we see you know, much less fluidity, much less development, much less dynamism, then it's much more of a problem to, to see a kind of a situation where, for example, ones with high fixed costs, large industrial markets, which have been very, very unchanging for long periods of time, particularly in commodity areas, the two firm structure there is often very bad for competition um, or the three firm structure. So I think it, you know, we, we really pay attention not just to the, the current distributional concentration levels, but also to the fundamentals, as you rightly say, around entry barriers, you know, how many people can come into this market and also what's the consumer dynamic, what's the amount of pressure you're getting from the from from, from big retailers in that market or from consumers directly. Absolutely one of the areas that we um, are most active thinking about in our economic analysis. Um, also briefly, if I might just say, I think you touched on a really interesting and good point around there are markets with lots of players in where nevertheless the competitive dynamic doesn't seem very good. Um, Payday is certainly one where there are a lot of players. Um, the mortgage market, insurance markets are all ones where um, there is scope for, we feel, a, a poor competitive dynamic notwithstanding a, a large number of players. And if we do do a market inquiry into banking, which of course we haven't yet decided, a key question we'll be asking all these, the, the inquiry group will be asking is, um, are there barriers to entry? Are there ways in which new players can can come in with new technology, new 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 techniques, or are there barriers that really make it very difficult for them to get in? And and some really interesting questions around that. Thank you, Margaret McDougall. Thank you, and good morning. I really in the strategic goals which you've mentioned in the briefing, you speak about developing new resources to help businesses understand law and so forth. Could you perhaps say, tell us a little about that? Well, we think that um, having greater appreciation uh, in the boardrooms around the, around the country to, uh, to understand what the law is in respect of competition law, notably collusive behaviour and cartels and so on, making sure that people understand that there are things that are not legitimate, that are illegal, and can be can lead to prosecution, as as we've prosecuted in, in in the past. Having that awareness in the boardroom, I think is very is very important. We think is very important. We want to put resource into making people understand what the law is, what is permissible business behaviour, and what is not. You can't go around all the boardrooms. No, but we can we can find as many forums as we can and find ways of of, of communicating effectively with with business clearly it's a challenge and we won't be perfect in it we want to we want to put more resource into it though because we think it is a very important aspect of our work yes and, and we we find that we're, we're trying to to increase our, our direct links with business bodies um uh in fact this week i'm meeting with the institute of directors but also working with the professional advisors to businesses so last week i met with the chartered institute of internal auditors we've worked in scotland a lot with the scottish competition law forum um, and with the Law Society as well. Um, we find that uh, a joint approach often works very well. So um, given that our criminal powers uh, uh, don't extend right across the country and for criminal prosecutions, we need to work very closely, obviously, in Scotland with the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. So um, we just two months ago actually published a, um, a joint article between ourselves and the Crown Office um, in the uh, Journal of the Law Society in Scotland about uh, the, new, the new powers there are, how we cooperate, and the, the legal changes that have been made. So we do work very hard to make sure that both firms directly get sources of information from their, uh, from, from their representative groups, but also that the advisors to firms, whether they be lawyers or auditors, or in some cases financial advisors, are well informed about competition and consumer law and understand um, the consequences if you break it, um, but also the, the, the merits uh, of, of complying with, with law, uh, the law fully. Thank you. 
Can I just <clears throat> add in terms of the Scottish context, we've got a number of events that we've got planned between now and the end of the year, specifically aimed at business organisations, pu perhaps public sector organisations, procurement organisations, to help them understand a little bit more about our work. And to support that, we've recently published a number of little summaries um, which we intend sort of uh, circulating and getting into some of the business press just to help people understand in a fairly simple way what what things they are they should be looking out for and and also explaining how they can get in touch with us to tell us about what's what's happening in their area 60 second summary is that's right because we know how busy people are right, okay and you mentioned earlier in a response to i think it was uh, mr mckenzie's um, question that you have 600 staff so how many of them are based in scotland at the moment we have uh two based in scotland the um the agencies that we were a merger, as David was saying at the outset, and uh, we were a merger of the Office of Fair Trade and Competition Commission, both of whom were headquartered in London, and uh, for um, we had the responsibility both to take on the existing staff, but also um, to take on one of the two offices, and that decision was taken by uh, biz ministers, in fact, before um, we got underway, and they chose one of those two offices as our future main base of operations. So, clearly in our initial formative stage we were very much concerned about bringing together those two bodies in an efficient way um, to make sure that we were able to fulfill our statutory functions but as David said one thing that we gave absolute priority to um, within the first month of uh, getting started was to establish a network of offices uh, right across the UK um, which we didn't inherit so both in Northern Ireland uh, in Belfast uh, in Cardiff and here in Edinburgh and, um, and we haven't tried to take an approach to say that um, it's only in the regional or national offices that we get um, uh, the views about what is happening in, in Scotland or in Wales or Northern Ireland. We, we want to say to all of the 600, make sure that you pay attention in your projects, in your analysis, in your work on the important differences that, that do exist throughout the UK in terms of how markets really function. So we haven't, rather than saying, it's just this team's the responsibility. It's everybody's responsibility, and we couldn't have been clearer or more consistent internally in emphasising that. And I have to say, you know, staff have responded extremely positively and well to that. It's two staff for Scotland doesn't seem sufficient to cover all. You know what you're talking about doing, getting out to businesses and and you know providing all that information. I see. Yeah. I see the role of uh, the Scotland office as being a door to the rest of the organisation. And, you know, our role is to help colleagues in London um, make the contacts that they need for the pieces of work that they're doing. The expertise of what's happening in Scotland, I mean, that's my concern. Well, I mean, our, our role in Scotland is to help them with the, with the expertise and put them in contact with the consumer bodies, the business organisations. We were talking about banking. We had a, a team came up recently to talk to Scottish Financial Enterprise specifically about our banking work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that face-to-face -face contact between experts and, and people with knowledge is, is, is as equally important as, you know, s establishing a, a, a larger team who may really still only be able to, to skate along the surface of, of the volume of work that we do. What I think is important is getting people up here, being visible up here, and our role in the Scotland office is to provide the events and opportunities for them to do that. And, uh, I mean... Our basic mode of work is to gather evidence and, do, and carry out analysis, and our evidence gathering is absolutely right across the UK, both from obviously written representations, which are a very important thing as well, but also from the face-to-face -face meetings and site visits, um, and from market research, as I was describing in our relation to, to energy and banking and um, payday sectors, there's been you know, a real focus on, on Scotland within that, and so I don't think that the, the way in which institutionally we're, we're structured um, from a point of view of geographical location of staff doesn't re really describe the amount of involvement that we have with with Scotland as a market which is which is very heavy and constant okay thank you okay thank you um Chick Brody, yeah, follow up. You. just very briefly um I'm glad to hear that um, you're going to propagate your uh, enterprise <coughs> to businesses I'm sure uh, a couple of high profile legal cases would help uh, concentrate the minds of some uh, who don't uh, abide by the rules. I wonder, in terms of, you've talked about the consumer benefit, but of course the consumer can benefit 
if um, there's more efficiency in government. I just wonder, I know you're very busy with it, but I just wonder what thought you've given to uh, looking at competition in, in supply of products, say medical products or defence products, uh, you know, uh, uh, on your agenda. Are you going to look at that and see what uh, impact, hopefully more than you know, half a billion pounds? Are you going to look at that at some stage in the future, look at competition as it affects prices to government? The answer is, is yes, we do get the opportunity to, to do that um, and we take it uh, wherever we can. So sometimes that comes up in mergers. Um, so to give a couple of examples, we recently did uh, a, a merger case in relation to um, uh, health technology products which are used by the NHS. Um, we also have uh, two ongoing enforcement cases in relation to pharmaceuticals which uh, have a huge cost for um, the NHS in Scotland as well as other parts of the UK um, and uh, we uh, we're also doing a merger case recently in relation to um, uh, some uh, quarry businesses here uh, the supply of asphalt um, and aggregates which obviously is a massive cost um, for, um, for for the public purse really and um, roads um, we've done a, uh, a market inquiry in relation to aggregates as a whole which again had a strong Scottish dimension to it um, so those uh, would be some examples that come to mind of trying to, I suppose, look at, at supply markets, in those cases healthcare and um, building materials, um, which end up being borne by uh, the public sector um, costs. We're also um, looking at uh, rolling out a scheme now with the uh, National Audit Office and Audit Scotland to try and help give better advice to people about how to conduct procurement and in particular what are signs of collusive tendering, which obviously isn't a, you know, is a hardcore criminal offence from the cartel law perspective, um, and to try and make sure that they both design their um, procurement in a way that's efficient and gives you know, good, good, good incentives for, for players, but also that they themselves are very alive to the possibility of this kind of collusive tendering and that we're able to um, get in, in, involved in dealing with that. Um, maybe the last one to mention that comes to mind is the um, construction industry where the one of our predecessor bodies, the OFT, brought a very substantial uh, cartel case involving 102 firms uh, within uh, the, the construction industry engaged in what's called cover pricing where people put a, a kind of a phony bid in effectively um, and uh, that resulted in substantial fines which um, I hope will meet the, the, the test you set for us which I appreciate of high profile legal cases to concentrate people's minds. Okay. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think our, our, our time is up. Uh, on behalf of the committee, can I just say a thank you to you all for coming along and answering our questions. And I hope um, you know, maybe some of the questions have given you, you know, a, a flavour of some of the interests the committee has, and I hope we can continue with the uh, level of engagement that you know, some of us have had with, uh, with, with Sheila Scobie so far, and uh, you know, we can perhaps uh, get you back here uh, on a future occasion to discuss uh, how the various inquiries are, are proceeding. So thank you very much, and at this point we'll suspend briefly and uh, go into private session. Thank you. Thank you very much for very useful, and we'd be delighted to come back on future occasions. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.